OK, I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction. And then we're going to sort of knit what Helen did last week, because it's kind of really a, a follow-on passage. But it also marks a kind of a change in Jesus' emphasis. There are going to be emailed notes, so you'll get those at, um, for your emails. And uh, there'll be a number of sort of questions and passages that you may want to meditate in terms of homework and things. Okay, Matthew 21 marks the beginning in a change of emphasis in Jesus' ministry. Instead of teaching the crowd with the aid of parables, he instead concentrates on preparing his disciples for his coming death and suffering. Now, up until this point, the disciples have been gradually learning who this Jesus is. And they had stopped what they had been previously doing, fishing and tax collecting, and they had begun to follow him. Now, in all probability, they may have been initially attracted by his words. They probably would have listened to things that he'd been saying. And they would probably have been attracted to the person of Jesus. And they'd made a decision to start a journey with him. A journey that involved them sort of listening and watching. Um, a journey that Jesus started teaching them new things. And he taught them how to see the world with fresh eyes. Now, like the disciples, you and me are also on a journey with Jesus. And we may, we might have started off wanting to know, you know, who is this Jesus and what's he all about? The Alpha course is kind of where I sort of started my little sort of interest, my journey, uh, which is about, I think, about 17 years ago. So the Alpha course, things like men's and women's breakfast and film nights can be sort of opportunities for us to begin to see who this Jesus is and also who his church is. And so can attending and in accepting invitations to come along to Sunday morning worship and home groups. Home groups are very important in part of our journey. And it is through these events that we start to know a little bit more who this Jesus is. And we also begin to see the world around us through a set of different eyes also. Now you might want to kind of ask, I want to ask you a question. You know, is it, was it a bit like that for you? How did your journey start with Jesus? Now I, don't, I didn't come from a Christian background. Um, you know, my parents were good people. Um, they had a faith like most other people up and down the country, but they didn't really know God. And I know some of you here have been born into Christian families, but you would have had an awakening at some point, a part of your journey. Yes, you might have been dragged here by your parents uh, for many years, but at some point, a little change took place. And for yourself, you might have started to think, you know, actually, who is this Jesus? see all about. Now, whilst the disciples, and you and me also, are on this journey, we eventually get to a point when we really know for certain who this Jesus is. And that's what exactly happened just before this passage and Helen talked about last week. So just prior to today's reading, the fol and following on from Helen, um, Helen's sermon last week, we read that Jesus asks the disciples, who do they think he, who they think he, Jesus, is? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now in teaching, and there are a number of teachers in here, we kind of live for these little moments and they are called gestalt. They're called gestalt moment or an aha moment. And it's when um, those little pieces click into place. All those separate pieces of information come together and they make sense. But in this case, it's, slight, you know, it's a little bit more than that. As Helen said last week, it's when the head and the heart sort of connect together aided by our Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit 
and, they, and he brings revelation, which is something hidden, but now revealed by God. So last week we heard that disciples, perhaps headed up with Peter, they had that moment, that aha moment, and they knew who this Jesus was. Now, like Peter and the other disciples, have you had that aha moment for yourself? Do you really know, personally, who this Jesus really is? And Helen said, you know, who, who do you say I am? If Jesus said that to you, who would you say he is? Now, if you've not had that moment, then keep on walking with Jesus and ask him, ask him to reveal himself to you. Because he will, he is a God, he is a person who listens to us and he wants that relationship with us. Don't give up. So that's a little bit of an introduction. So, so now on to verse 21 onwards for today's scripture reading. So at this point, the disciples know for certain who this Jesus is. He's God's anointed one, God's son. So Jesus now moves them on to the next stage of their journey with him. And he now explains to them that it is necessary for him to go to Jerusalem where he would suffer greatly at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the religious law, and that he must even be killed but raised back to, raised back to life on the third day after his death. And that's Matthew 16, 21. Now, clearly, this message came as a bit of a shock to the disciples at this stage of their journey. And we read that Peter rebukes Jesus for um, suggesting such a thing, that he would be, he would suffer and die. Peter didn't like that. And he wouldn't have been the only disciple at the time either. Now I'm not going to dwell too much on that bit of the passage, but I would like to make the point that not everything Jesus says makes sense to us. when we walk with Jesus. Now, Jesus, this may be a bit annoying and a bit frustrating for you and I. He doesn't always give us nicely packaged information that we think we need at the time that we think we need it. Remember, you and I, like the disciples, are on a journey with Jesus. So I've lost myself. Oh, yeah. remember that we are on a journey with Jesus Jesus often gives us the information when we are ready to receive it so are we ready to go on to that next stage he doesn't just give us the end picture and dumps a lot of information onto us he's very mindful and sensitive he's a good father also Jesus wants us to think things out for ourselves and back to teaching, you know, that's called learning. You know, Jesus taught in parables so that the crowd would ponder and chew over what he said. He doesn't want us to give up. He wants us to put a bit more effort into our relationship with him. So otherwise, our journey would become a bit boring and our relationship with Jesus would be a bit shallow so, then, so when we read things in the Bible and perhaps God is saying things to us, we don't quite understand it. Don't give up. There's a tension there. There's a learning tension. And Jesus is wanting us to, to spend a little bit more time chewing on it. Perhaps we talk to others about it. And Helen's, I'm mentioning a lot of Helen today. She's been, she did some great stuff last week. And that thing about... Um, that Bible event that she's talking about, that's about chewing a bit of scripture over. That's about us sort of re, um, processing it. And through that, we all know who this Jesus is. We'll know a little bit more about him. 
Now comes Jesus' major teaching point to all his disciples, and that's you and us, you and me in this room as well. Okay, so this is verse 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now that's the NIV version. But the truth version reads it like this as well. If anyone makes the decision to be my follower, he will have to deny what he wants for himself. He must be prepared to suffer willingly any any cross of sacrifice asked of me. Then he can follow me. It's quite a tough passage, this. So what does to take up your cross mean? There's a nice little website, and there's a chap called John Piper, and, and you might want to have a look at this. It will be in the links. There'll be a link on this in your notes called desiringgod.org. It's very good, and you can sort of friend him on Facebook, and there's a lot of sort of scriptures and things that he goes through, and I think I find him sort of very helpful. So according to, this, according to John Piper, taking up your cross and not somebody else's cross would signify at least four things. So that's opposition, shame, suffering, and death. So let's just expand a little bit on those. Opposition. A, a cross was used to execute criminals who had the state of Rome in opposition to them. Shame. This execution was reserved for the, the worst criminals and the victims were usually naked on the cross for hours. Suffering. This kind of execution was designed to prolong excruciating pain. And death, the aim of crucifixion was death, not torture, followed by release. And Jesus kind of experienced, that was his cross. He experienced, very much actual fact, those things. So therefore, when Jesus said that the way to follow him was to take up our cross, He means this. Be willing, without murmuring, or God criticism or cowardice, to be opposed, sorry, to be opposed, to be shamed, to suffer and to die. Or as John Piper puts it, to treasure Jesus more than we treasure human approval, honor, comfort, and life. And in a way, those really spoke to me. I think, my goodness, there's my crosses for a start. Um, Okay, so let's break some of these down a little bit. So what do we mean by human approval? This is when, well, human approval is thinking more about what people think about us than what Jesus thinks about us. It's about doing things which improve other people's perception of us. That's what human approval is. So we do things that improve other people's perception of us. This may be not speaking out or turning a blind eye to the things we see or hear around us. It could be about going along with the crowd because other people would think less highly of us if we didn't do or say those things. This may be, and you might want to kind of think about this, perhaps one of the sins the older brother and the prodigal son committed. I think he had a number of sins, the older brother. So what is honor? This is opposite to humility, and it's the craving of attention and glory. It's doing things that attract the attention of others so that we can receive praise. The Pharisees were full of this in their showy prayers, the clothes that they wore. They wanted to sit at the top table. They'd have fitted very well in today's society. A lot of the issues that we probably have about now is to do with honor and glory. And I'm not saying these things happen in church, but I've seen lots of people get burned out by pursuing honor because they want to do everything. We might, you might know people like this, at work, who seem to want to do all those kind of things, and they get burnt out. 
But conversely, people might only do the things which get noticed and not the things that go unseen because they wouldn't get honor. The other difficult one for us, probably individually and as a society, is comfort. And this can be associated with material comfort, and this one's definitely me, and also wanting a quiet, trouble-free life. The problem with the pursuit of a comfortable life is that it often means that we ignore or turn a blind eye to other people's discomfort. And we may choose to ignore those around us because that will mean we'd have to give something up. And that would mean we'd be less comfortable. So the pursuit of comfort can lead to inaction and injustice. And you might want to have a think about perhaps the parable of the Good Samaritan is a little bit about that. Those people who walked on by. I've got loads of homework to do about this, okay? <laughs> In essence, if we pick, in essence, if we are to pick up our cross, then we need to die to self. But what does denying, what does it mean to deny myself? And how is that possible? Well, it means to give your life to God. You are, no, you are not in charge any longer. I love Jesus more than human approval, honor, comfort, and life. So I'm ready to endure opposition, shame, suffering, and death. In Jesus' teaching to the disciples here in Matthew 16, 21 onwards, he is telling them, his disciples, that they are a new self. And they should, be, they should start acting like it. Remember, they've had their aha moment. They really know who this Jesus is. That, that connection, that aha, those things coming together should lead to a change. Now, there are people in this church who have also reached this stage in, that, in their journey. And we too are to deny our old comfort craving self and embrace the superior joy of knowing Jesus no matter how high the cost on this earth. So why is that? Why, why, why do we need to do that? Well, verse 25 to 27 reads as follows. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good would it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Human approval, honor and glory, comfort. Are they, can we, would we want to exchange those things? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with, the, with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Now sometimes as Christians, our time scale and perspectives are skewed because it's actually really hard not to focus on the here and now. The moment, as it were, this moment it's a lot more easier to imagine than perhaps eternity. And yes, those current moments may be stressful and embarrassing, perhaps uncomfortable and painful, but it won't always be like that. Sometimes it's hard for us to think, actually, is it ever going to be different? A short lifespan is nothing when we try to compare it against the impossibly difficult task of imagining what, imagining what eternity is like. A time when we will see Jesus face to face 
and experience endless joy in his presence. Jesus, in verse 25, is pleading with you and me to save our lives in eternity by losing them in this world. So how do we get into our position when we are truly able to deny ourselves and give our life to God? How is that possible? Now remember that we, just like the disciples, are on a journey with Jesus. We're all at different stages on that journey. And we don't need to, nor should we, nor should we compare ourselves with those around us. Often we kind of make judgments, we kind of, you know, I'm only here, they're there. What is important to Jesus is the fact that we are on this journey with him. That's what's important. Now, Jesus wants us to spend time with him. He wants a relationship with you and me. He wants to get to know us. And he wants us to get to know him. Yes, there will be highs and lows on those journeys. It's a relationship. All relationships have highs and lows. And we know that the Gospels speaks very clearly about that with the disciples. If you've read the disciples, you know that they have ups and downs on their journey with Jesus. The disciples needed to spend time with Jesus. They needed to spend time watching him and listening to him. And letting him show us to see the world around us with fresh eyes. And you and I need to do that also. I always seem to come back to every single my sermon, always comes back to this kind of relationship and time. You know, are you spending enough time with Jesus? Is this it? So what are we talking? We're normally in about an hour and a half. Is that it? And then you go home, tick, done, done Jesus. Put him, put him aside, leave him at the church. Are you spending enough time with Jesus? Do you really want to know who this Jesus is? It is you may want to think about the next bit. It is, it is only really with reading his word in the Bible and through times of prayer that we truly get to know who this Jesus is. It's not always doing a lot. It's, it's kind of having that moment with him and speaking to him and asking him questions. I love things like the book of Habakkuk because that's about asking God questions. And I just think it just allows an opportunity. I really believe God answers those questions because why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he answer our questions? Why would he not come into our lives? Now, sometimes we have issues we don't think we're worthy well, none of us are worthy. It doesn't stop him coming to meet us. Those disciples, those 12 disciples, not one of them was worthy for him to spend. So, you know, they weren't good in themselves to justify and warrant him to have a relationship. Jesus met them despite that. He wanted to spend time with those guys and all the other people he has been meeting with for the last 2,000 years. In fact, God has been wanting to do that ever since creation. Remember, you have been purchased at a price. And I love kind of Holy Communion services because it just it echoes that. It represents that, the bread and the wine. You have been purchased for a price. Going all the way back to verse 21. Jesus went to Jerusalem to die on that cross 
for you. This love cost him his life. And God's love for his son raised him up from the dead on the third day. I'm just going to finish on a verse uh, from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Again, this will be in your notes. And I pray, pray that you sort of spend time on this at home, perhaps in home groups, and ask God to reveal himself, perhaps to speak to him about it. Spend time chewing over this passage. Because I believe that Jesus will reveal himself to you through that. So here we go, Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. And I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the real life I now have within this body is a result of my trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. Amen.